you want something to think about as we go through these chapters, you can think about this idea. I think they reveal or remind us of a God who is worthy of more. And to that end, my prayer is that he lays that out before us this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 27. Then David said in his heart, Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. Remember last week in 1 Samuel chapter 26, David had spared Saul's life. Saul had even, in response to David's refusal to lift his hand against the Lord's anointed, Saul had responded that he recognized that David would be the next king of Israel and he would leave him alone. Though David didn't believe that if he stayed within the confines of the promised land, excuse me, the confines of Israel, then Saul would continue to hunt him down. So in verse or chapter 27, we read, Then David said in his heart, Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. So David in his own thinking, and in his mind, and in his heart, decides that the only safe place for him was among his enemies. In case you don't remember, Goliath, whom David had miraculously eliminated as a threat to Israel, was a Philistine. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. So David arose and went over, he and the 600 men who were with him, to Achish, the son of Moak, the king of Gath, which is where Goliath was from. And David lived with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel, and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow. And when it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer sought him. Not because he didn't want to eliminate him, but because he was afraid of the Philistines. So from a political intrigue perspective, from a time of war and violence, there is a human level that can understand why David would be doing what he was doing. But I think I should remind all of us that despite our perspectives on what makes sense on a human level, there is always a bigger and better perspective. And we as Christians should own that like never before. So, Verse 5, David said to Achish, If I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be given me in one of the country towns that I might dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So that day Achish gave gave him Ziklag. Therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. And the number of days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was one year and four months. One of the things that's interesting about 1 Samuel chapter 27 is there is no overt mention of God. Like it's worth noting, and I will let you ruminate, meditate, and think about it. It's worth noting that we do not read that God led David to this place. Keep that in mind as we read what's next. Now David, verse 8, and his men went up and made raids against the Gershurites, the Gerzites, And the Amalekites, for these were the inhabitants of the land from of old as far as sure to the land of Egypt. Most of the time when we come across these names of peoples that are nearly impossible to pronounce. But thankfully, because of the presence of technology, we can have these names read to us, then memorize them and read them back to you. Welcome. I worked overtime for that. (laughs) 
Normally, when we read these names, we have a tendency to just kind of skip over them because we don't necessarily relate. But there's a clue that the writer gives us. It says that these were inhabitants of the land from the time of old. The time of old that he's referring to is most likely the time that Israel had been delivered out of the Red Sea, out of Egypt, and had become inhabitants in the promised land. So what the writer is wanting us to understand is these inhabitants were those who had lived in the promised land and around the promised land when the Israelites were delivered out of Egypt. And what we're supposed to draw out of that is these were the people who hassled God's people when they were coming into the land. And when I say hassle, I mean not just yell and tease, but they preyed on the weak and those who were at the back of the line, so to speak. And when I say preyed on them, they killed them. So David, while he's in the land of the Philistines, is making raids on these people that we're supposed to understand were ancient enemies of Israel. Don't forget, we still haven't read any hint of God's direction. And David, verse 9, would strike the land, and he would leave neither man nor woman alive, but would take away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the garments, and come back to Achish. And when Achish asked, where have you made raid today? See, there was an understanding between David and the king of the Philistines. There was an understanding that he would live in this area and he would go on raids. So the king would ask David, where have you made raid today? And David would say, against the Negev of Judah or against the Negev of the Jeharamalites. You're welcome. Or against the Negev of the Kenites. Again, names that we're not very familiar with, but here's the thing. The writer, the writer wants us to understand that David was out making raids against the ancient enemies of Israel when, his, when the king of the Philistines asked him where you have been and what, you have, been, what have you been doing. He says, he lies, he deceives, and says, I've been making raids against the people of Judah, the enemies of the Philistines. He lies. I spent some time reading this week, and there was more than one commentator, commentator who justified this deceit and lie by recognizing that it was a time of war, that he was on his own, and he had to do desperate things. Others would justify it by saying that even though God is not mentioned in this chapter overtly, that God was using David to bring judgment on the enemies of Israel. I would simply say he lies. He lies about doing things that it's very, very, very possible that God never led him to do. And David would leave neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, thinking lest they should tell about us and say, so David has done such. And this was his custom while he lived in the country of the Philistines. So for well over a year and a half, he had a habit of raiding the enemies of Israel, annihilating them so that there would be no one left to tell the king of Achish what he had done. And then he would lie to the king about where he was and what he had been doing. In Achish, verse 12 of chapter 27, trusted David, thinking he has made himself an utter stench to his people Israel. Therefore, he shall always be my servant. The king of the Philistines, Achish, bought it, hook, line, and sinker. Now again, there would be lots of people even in this day that would say that his actions were justified because his circumstances were terrible and after all, he was only protecting God's reputation and God's people. I would say he murdered and he lied. 
chapter 28, verse 1 through 2 continues this part of the passage. In those days, the Philistines gathered their forces for war to fight against Israel. And Achish said to David, understand that you, you and your men are to go out with me in the army. And David said to Achish, very well, you shall know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. As the readers, though we never do this because we're usually reading it for our morning devotions and we're in a hurry to get it done so we can have our coffee and go to work, and if you're not familiar with that kind of pressure, well, then your life is happier than the rest of ours. (laughs) We should pause and go, wait, what did I just read? That David agreed with the enemy of Israel to fight against his own people. Again, he's lying. If you continue to read ahead in the chapters to come, you'll recognize or you'll find out that the Philistine fighters themselves, when they see David coming to the battle, uh, reject his presence, go to King Achish and say, you need to get rid of him. He cannot be trusted. We do not want him fighting with us. We've seen how he fights, Goliath. We want nothing to do with this man who has killed his ten thousands. Chapter 27. I suggest to you that more than a prescription for when Christians find themselves in an overwhelming situation, in the midst of a confusing and overwhelming fight, more than a prescription of here's what you do and here's what's okay and here's what's not okay, don't forget that just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean that God has given his seal of approval. Just like with the multiple wives that his people, his men continued to marry, God never actually said that was okay. We don't have a record here of God saying, way to go, David. Otherwise, we would have to try to teach a five-year-old in a Sunday school class the fine nuances of adulthood when it pertains to when we can lie and God's okay with it and when we cannot. And to do so means that we would have to deny the truths of the scriptures which forbid lies across the board and deceit and murder and revenge and all of such things. I suggest to you that the timing of 1 Samuel chapter 27, in light of our own current events, is very, very important. Because I suggest it is a call for Christians to rise above the troubling confusion of our times and look to the Lord and allow him to lead, guide, and direct us and refuse to take matters into our own hands. I recognize that most likely for the majority of us, that's going to be pretty easy to do as it relates to everyday life not going to get on buses and travel to some far off place and exact revenge. We're not going to do those things. However, I'm on Facebook now. And I know what we write. And I know what we repost. And I know what we say. And if you're not comfortable with that, you better block me now. I think 1 Samuel chapter 27 is a call to us at Rogue Valley Christian Church. I don't know what anybody else is doing around the valley, but I know at Rogue Valley Christian Church, this is a call for us to be reminded that God is worthy of more than petty thoughts, thinkings, ideas, and opinions. He is worthy of more than, here, I'll give it to you. He is worthy of more than an end justifies the means mentality. While David remained loyal to Israel, 
he achieved protection for himself and the Israelites through violence and deception. Murder and, the, and deception. While we could assume that David was being used by God to judge Israel's enemies, we are not explicitly told that the Lord was directing David's actions, which means it's very possible that in the midst of a very personal troubling time, David decided to take matters into his own hands. I would caution all of us to avoid that idea. Because no matter what, we must have nothing to do with a mentality as Christians with the mentality that, that, that says, well, the ends justify the means. It's not right. It wasn't right then. And I suggest to you it's still not right now. It's time for us as believers to stop justifying evil actions on either side of the issues because one action or another aligns with our opinions. It is time to stop that if our opinions do not align themselves with God's heart. Which means this for many of us. It might be worthwhile to get off Facebook a little more and get into the scriptures so that we might know and hear and feel and sense the heart of God towards humanity. The people over here, the people over here, the people back here, the people over there. By the way, I'm not sure if you're aware of this. There's a lot of violence going on all over the world every single day. Chapter 27 is a reminder that God is worthy of more than, the, than a the ends justifies the means mentality. And believer and Christian, it doesn't matter what our circumstances are, that mentality will never be okay for us because it was not okay for Jesus. Just in case things couldn't get a little more awkward, we come across chapter 28. And I'm just going to give you a bit of a warning. If you've never read 1 Samuel chapter 28, things are about to get weird. 20, chapter 28, verse 3. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel mourned for him and buried him at Ramah, his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and necromancers out of the land. So let's just get this straight, okay? Samuel the prophet died. And before he died, Sam, Saul had driven out the mediums and the necromancers who were inhabiting Israel. Meaning this, that at this time, remember all the way back, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Including... Seeking those who could, by some force or power, predict the future. So it was okay, even in Israel, even though God forbade it in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 through 12. Look it up later. God had forbidden the presence of such individuals within, his, within the confines of his people. His people were to be a peculiar people who didn't need fortune tellers, or a necromancer, the word in that day meant someone who could interact with the dead so as to get wisdom and guidance. These people at this time were in the confines of Israel, presumably making money. And so the sense is, is that Saul had driven them out so as to appease the prophet Samuel, but Samuel had died now. And Saul is facing a big battle. He's terrified of the enemy, the Philistines. So, look at what happens. 
Verse 4, the Philistines assembled and came and encamped at Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel, and they encamped at Gilboa. And when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart was troubled greatly. Some might say, well, wasn't that the way Saul always was? And the answer would be yes. On the other hand, from my perspective, I don't like fighting either. So from a human level, I, I get it. The Philistines were big, and they had bad reputations. They were a terrifying force. So Saul is afraid. Here's the interesting thing. He was still breathing. Yes? He had not yet died. Which means he still had the ability to look to God, say he was sorry for his sinful actions, and seek help. Ladies and gentlemen, no matter how bad it gets, if you're still breathing, you can still repent. Like, that is always a better option than what Saul is about to do. So, in verse 6, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. According to the traditions of their day. Let me add this. It's never too late to look to the Lord and say you're sorry. But when you do so, it has to be wholehearted and pure. You have to mean it. You can't fake it with God, which is what Saul was doing. You can't go to God and apologize so that he will get you out of a jam. That's not Christianity. So, after not hearing from the Lord, most likely because his heart wasn't honest in it, then Saul said to his servant, seek out for me a woman who is a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, behold, there is a medium at Endor. Our little kids right now in the Sunday school class are learning about the witch of Endor. I have an app on my Bible that reads the or on my phone that reads the Bible to me. The witch at Endor, this medium at Endor, her voice sounded like the witch in Snow White. To which I thought, you didn't have to do that. <laughs> we don't have to dumb it down. Moms and dads, if your kids start coming out and they're terrified that there's witches in the world, <coughs> tell them to suck it up and trust in Jesus. <laughs> so, he's told there is this witch, there is this medium at Indoor. So Saul disguised himself, which Saul was really good at pretending to be something that he wasn't, which is why God didn't hear his prayers. He was pretending to be somebody that he wasn't. Listen. And he put on garments and he went and had and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. <laughs> and he said, divine for me by a spirit and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. And the woman said to him, surely you know that Saul you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the necromancers from the land. Why then are you laying a trap for my life to bring about my death? You know if I do this, the king will have me killed. She doesn't know that it's the king. How confusing was Saul's reign. Which, by the way, is the way it is with humans, isn't it? Just so everybody is clear on this, there's been one good leader in all of humanity. His name was Jesus, and he refused to lead according to the wisdom of the world. There's been one good leader in all of humanity. His name is Jesus, who refused to lead according to the ways of the world. Then the woman, verse 11, said, whom shall I bring up for you? Excuse me, but, Paul, but Saul swore to her by the Lord. Did you get that? But Saul swore to her by the Lord. As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. I think that's ridiculous. Then the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, bring up Samuel for me. Um, they were just all playing spirituality. They were just playing a part. 
And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud, loud voice. And the woman said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. And the king said to her, do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a God, little g, coming up out of the earth. And he said to her, what is his appearance? And she said to him, an old man is coming up and he is wrapped in a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel. And he bowed his face to the ground and paid homage. Then Sam, as if that's going to make it better. Do you, can I just make a statement that God's people throughout the history of God's people, which includes us, have done ridiculously stupid things? Do you agree? Have you ever? I won't. Never mind. <laughs> then Samuel, verse 15, said to Saul, why have you disturbed me? By bringing me up. And Saul, <laughs> and Saul answered, I am in great distress, for the Philistines are warring against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more, either by the prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I have summoned you to tell me what shall I do. And Samuel said, Why then do you ask me, since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done to you as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also tomorrow. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. Just so we're clear, you will die. Then the Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. This is very sad. Not at all what Saul was expecting to hear. Then Saul fell at once, full length on the ground, filled with fear because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten nothing all day and all night. And some might add his true colors finally show themselves. There was no strength in him, though he appeared to be very strong. And the woman came to Saul, and when she saw that she, he was terrified, she said to him, Behold, your servant has obeyed you. I have taken my life in my hand. <coughs> I have risked my own life to tell you what I have listened to. <coughs> and you have said to me, now, now, therefore, you also obey your servant. Let me set a morsel of bread before you and eat that you may have strength when you go on your way. And he refused, and he said, I will not eat. But his servants together with the woman urged him, and he listened to their words. So he arose from the earth and sat on the bed, and the woman had a fatted calf in the house, and she quickly killed it and took the flour and kneaded it and baked unleavened bread of it. And she put it before Saul and his servants, and they ate. Then they arose and went away by night. It's very clear that Saul was violating God's laws from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 through 12. And he would have to suffer the consequences of his sin and refusal to truly turn away from his sin and turn to God. And while it seems obvious that the mindset and movements of Saul are wrong, if we're not careful, we can quickly fall into the same sense that he did. You see, I think chapter 27 is a war or chapter 28 is a warning and a reminder that God is worthy of more than a by any means necessary mindset. He is worthy of more than a by any means necessary mindset. This is what Saul got trapped into, and it seems obvious that this should be avoided, yet we can quickly fall into the same sense that we, when, that we can accomplish our desires in our own way by any means necessary. I think it's a timely reminder. I think it's important to remember a God who is above all and everything that is going on, not only in our area, country, but even in the whole world. And we as believers are supposed to rise above all of that. We're supposed to rise above it from the inside out. We're supposed to have a heart that longs to hear from God, longs to look to God, that is willing to make any correction necessary. We're supposed to be reminded that God is worthy of more than what we often give him. And what I mean by that is this, maybe it not on a big old serious level do we have a mindset that says the ends justify the means. 
I've told you once before about a time where I was coaching my son's little league team. And he was eight years old. He's now 30. Still mad at me to this day. Because when he was eight years old, we were at a coach pitch league, and we showed up early so that he could get some extra batting practice because I'm just a good dad like that. And upon pitching him some batting practice, at one point he turns to bunt. And if you don't know baseball, then talk to me later. But he turns to bunt. And if you do know baseball, you know this. If you were a pitcher and someone turns to bunt on you, you go high and tight on them. <laughs> Meaning this, JD's nodding. You send them a little chin music. Moms, if you don't know what that means, talk to your husbands. <laughs> if Moms, if you have a problem with that kind of competition, trust your husbands. So my son turned to bunt. I threw the pitch, and I was blown away because I didn't teach him to bunt. And he looks, I look at him, and I go, where'd you learn that? He goes, I read it. Read it in a book. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. I'm super proud of him. So I pitch a couple more pitches. After about the third or fourth pitch, he turns to bunt again. So I went chin music on him. I threw one high and tight right at his head. He bails, throws a bat, falls on the ground, gets all upset at me. Dad, what are you doing? To which I responded, I'll bet you didn't read that in a book. <laughs> Here's the sad thing about that moment, which I regret. I was operating from a mindset and believed that it was good as a father to interact with my son in a way that the ends justified the means. Because he would learn the fine nuances of baseball and understand how things work. Now, if this, all this baseball talk is new to you and you've decided I will never let my kid play baseball now, they don't really do that in Little League, at least on purpose. And if the coaches call for that, they should be fired. However, in high school, I'm just saying. <laughs> in conversations with my full-grown son, I've come to regret that moment more than a lot of others. Because it encapsulated an arrogance in me that decided that I knew better than God. You see, I was a Christian at that time. But I believed I knew more about baseball and raising kids than God did. And I easily slid into this mindset that says, it's fine because the ends justify the means. He'll be a better baseball player because of it. It wasn't too long after that he didn't play baseball anymore. He played golf where I couldn't coach him. I think 1 Samuel chapter 27 is a warning. Not just a reminder. It's a warning that God is worthy of more than an end justifies the means mentality by his people. We should not justify lying, cheating, stealing, violence. We should not justify any kind of thing that the Bible or God himself calls evil because we're trying to accomplish some sort of good that's better than others. We should not do that. And just so you know, regardless of what side you're on, that kind of evil includes some sort of retaliation. And I recognize that none of us can retaliate, or whoever might want to can retaliate in one way or the other, but I do know that you can write stuff on Facebook and you should not. Before you type out a post on social media, why don't you do this, set it down, spend some time in prayer. Chapter 28, though, is another reminder, and I think it's a solemn reminder that this mentality that says by any means necessary does not work. Because in order for us to buy into the any means necessary mindset, it means that we have to take matters into our own hands, which flies against everything in Scripture. Scripture is constantly reminding us to turn it over, to submit it to God. So what would be appropriate? Well, in closing, turn to Romans chapter 12, where we read earlier. 
God is worthy of more than those things. And if you have been doing those things, thinking those things, or guilty of those things, it is okay to let go of them today. It is not okay to hold on to them any longer. I recognize I'm just a young man among you, but make no mistake about it, I take the call to pastor very seriously. And because I love you, let me remind you, it is okay to let go of those mindsets and mentalities because they are getting in the way of your relationship with God. It is okay to set them down today. It is not okay to hold on to them any longer because as chapter 27 and 28 of 1 Samuel describes, it just makes a mess. And it is not becoming of Christianity. It is not shining the light. It is not glorifying God. It is not giving a witness to the greatness of God Almighty, who, by the way, is great over and above and beyond the United States of America. Instead, we have to be reminded, well, then what is he worthy of? You see, if I just stopped there and walked off the stage, it wouldn't be loving and kind. Don't do this. Good luck on figuring out what you're supposed to do. <laughs> However, it's worth taking a few more minutes to be reminded of what God calls us to do, of what God has given us a privilege to do. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. This is after talking about the grace of God for 11 chapters. By the way, it's a grace that, according to the Apostle Paul, when he wrote Romans, it was a grace that was available to all people. It was a grace that was available to Greeks, Romans. It was a grace that was available to Jews and Gentiles. It was a grace that was available to barbarians and Scythians. It was a grace that was available to Republicans and Democrats. It was a grace that was available to white people and black people and Filipino people and Asian people and all the Samoan people and any other type of people, the Welsh people, the English people, the Irish people, the Spanish people. I'm just going to keep going. The Russian people. It's it's a grace that's available to everyone. Did you guys see that? If you're here and you're any of those people and you're thankful for the grace that God has given you, then what happens next should be appropriated by you. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, by what you yourself have experienced I appeal to you to let go of those mindsets, the mindset that says the ends justify the means or the mindset that says by any means necessary. Paul is saying to you and I, God is speaking through his word to you and I today, and I feel this in the depths of my soul. That we are to let that go, and we are instead, because of his mercy, to embrace something else. I appeal to you to remember that he is worthy of our worship. Look at what he says. I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Did you guys see that? Christians are supposed to think differently. I feel like we need to just sit in that one a little bit. Christians are supposed to think differently. I'm going to push it further. Christians are supposed to think differently. And just because someone calls himself a Christian doesn't mean that they get to dictate how we think. Saul himself would have called himself a faithful Jew. Christians are supposed to think differently because it's the presence of God in their lives are supposed to transform not only their heart, but also their mind. I suggest you a transformed mind is always looking above the fray. I suggest you a transformed mind may have nothing to do with reposting other people's thoughts. 
That one, by the way, just so you know, it's my own opinion. That is not the voice of the Lord. That's just my own opinion. And if you're mad at me because I have a microphone and I get to say my own opinion, just know this. If you go to church here for any length of time, I do not do that very often. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. If he's worthy of more than those other things, and we have to remember according to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he is worthy of our worship. And what that looks like is not just singing. Do you guys know that? Ladies and gentlemen, if you're new to the church world, when we say worship, we're not just talking about singing. We're not just talking about Troy and, and Kelly singing us songs and us going, oh, we're not talking about that. What we're talking about includes that, but it's more than that. What it is, is this. Here I am, God. A living sacrifice. In other words, here I am, God. Not my will be done, but yours. Here I am, God. And I think this, and I want to do that, but I belong to you. So you have your way within me. Here I am, God. I'm willing to lay down all of me so that you can be glorified in me and through me. Here I am, God. This is worship, and he's worthy of that. Can you imagine the effect on our culture that that would have if we as believers started doing that with every single one of our moments? My son wouldn't have baseball scars to this day. Verses Three through eight, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we all we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though we are many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We're inseparable, having gifts that differ according to the grace that God is giving us. Let us use them if prophecy in proportion of our faith, if service in, in our serving. The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. God is worthy of our humility because that's what he's talking about. Do you guys find it ironic that Christians have become some of the most arrogant people in the world these days oh excuse me i won't speak for everybody around the world i'll just speak for what i experience in medford when did we lose our way and stop embracing humility as a characteristic and instead exchange it for arrogant statements of judgment hate hurt and all of those things if we're going to offer ourselves, if he's worthy of our worship, then he's worthy of our humility. That we recognize that one is not more important than the other. We belong to each other, and we're all put together so as to help one another. And when we help one another, there's this beautiful reflection to the world around us of what God is really actually like in this world. But as long as we keep bickering, ranting, and raving... We miss that opportunity, and I think it's sad. Verses 9 through 16, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. I think it's worth saying again, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. That's worth repeating. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless, woo, you guys ready? It's in the Bible. I'm trying not to distract us with my own personal desire to move. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is, in, what is honorable in the sight of all. 
he is worthy of not only our worship and humility, but he is worthy of our faithfulness. And what I mean by faithfulness is that willingness to say, I have faith in Jesus. And because I have faith in Jesus, then I'm going to believe that he can work through me even in these ways, even when it feels like they won't work. Because that's exactly where David and Saul were. They chose different ways. One's called a man after God's own heart. One story we read very sadly. They did the same thing. It's my estimation, in my opinion, that they both took matters into their own hands and made messes out of their circumstances and situations. When we honor God, when we recognize he's worthy of our faithfulness in this moment, in that moment, in this conversation, in that conversation, in every single circumstance, guess what happens? We begin to manifest to the world kindness, love, honor, forgiveness, joy, patience, hospitality, mercy, compassion, and empathy. If you call yourself a Christian, if we call ourselves Christian and these things are not flowing from our lives, we need to adjust something. Seventeen through nineteen, he's worthy of our trust. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. We just have to trust the Lord. And let him take care of what we can't take care of anyway. Does that make sense? Finally, he is worthy of our goodness. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Which, by the way, is not a vengeful thing, just so you know. It's a biblical description. You will bring warmth to their life. I remember when I was a new Christian, I'm like, yeah, let's do the burning coal thing. That guy made me mad, called me a bad name. I don't like him. He's a jerk face. So I'm going to get all biblical on his butt. <laughs> Head. To which I had a discipler go, listen there, Skippy. Why don't you chill out? The calling card of Christianity is not vengeance, it's goodness. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good.